thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a man who coined the term Bromo Sapien, Mike <laughs> Vandebogart. Thanks, Joe, and thank you once again uh, to everyone that's tuned in. would like to give our patron shout-outs for this episode. Uh, Helen Barber, Emma Tig, or Ty. Ty, sp- apologize for that, Emma. <laughs> uh, Ray Mosier, uh, Amy Barrett. Zach Morlock, uh, Brianda Hernandez, and Robert Lupton. So, uh, you know, thank you so much for helping support the show. We uh, we've got a lot of big plans for the show, and it, it you know it requires some money. So every every bit helps. So once again, thank you. And, Absolutely, thank you all very much. Yeah, and I would also one little update here. We recently uh, released a advertising section for our our page, our website. And it basically allows anybody out there who has a business, a product, a service, or maybe you just want to wish somebody a happy birthday that listens to the show. Um, we have a lot of different options for people to do, um, you know, advertising on our show through pre-roll or mid-roll. And uh, our uh, ad today actually uh, came from that section of our website. So we uh, we just launched it and. You know, check it out if you've got a business and you you want to advertise it on a you know a growing podcast. All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. January thirty first. 1971, 32-year-old Carol Turner drove to Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument in Arizona for a short vacation while she had some time off from teaching. Carol would spend the next couple of days hiking in the monument and going on nature walks with the rangers. On February 3rd, Carol went on a hike up to Bull Pasture and was never seen again. Join us this week as we investigate the unsolved disappearance of Carol Turner. Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument is in the AJO Mountains and comprises of 516 square miles or 330,000 acres in southern Arizona. Now, this is roughly the size of Hong Kong, according to research. So, I don't know, was there not like a, there's like not like a city in the United States that's a, that's relative to, it's just Hong Kong? Yeah, no, I mean, Hong Kong <laughs> comes in at about 424 square miles. I always like to put a comparison. Oh, so it's larger. Yeah, so yes. it is larger, but that was... Kind of the closest comparison I could find. That I know people like would know no cities in the U.S. that <laughs> I mean, it would be that a would be that big, big city. Yeah, so I, it's yeah. just kind of give people a sense of what we're working with. Sure, <laughs> and it does it does share a border with the Mexican state of Sonora. So that could be something that we want to think about later in the episode, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, uh, it was established on April thirteenth in nineteen thirty seven. And it sees roughly 260,000 visitors per year in non-COVID years. So that last number was in 2018. Mm -hmm. So just a couple historical facts about the area. In 1846, the Mexican-American War ended with Mexico ceding Upper California to the U.S. Oregon Pipe was still a part of Mexico at that point. In 1853, land south of the Gaia River was purchased from Mexico for $10 million. 
the land was purchased to build a Southern Pacific Railroad route to California. This land would later become part of the Arizona and New Mexico border. On August 9th, 2002, while pursuing members of a drug cartel who fled into the United States after a string of murders in Mexico, shot and killed 28-year-old law enforcement officer Chris Egel. I actually remember this yeah, in the monument. I do too. That was, uh, we, I was in high school. Yeah. This was in like junior year of high school. On July 29th, 2003, so the next year, the U.S. Congress passed a law designating Oregon Pipe National Monument Visitor Center as Chris Egel Visitor Center. Cutting down an endangered cactus like the Segoro could land you in prison for up to a year. So don't go to the <laughs> National Monument and cut down cacti. Cacti. Is it cacti or cactuses? I think it's cacti, but we'll be told There's if we're one, wrong. <laughs> yeah, one cactus, five cacti. Sounds right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure someone will be very upset by what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the legendary 1881 gunfight at the OK Corral in the Arizona Territory town of Tombstone is considered the most famous shootout in American Old West and lasted for only 30 seconds. So that was nearby. And uh, I t- oh, go ahead. Just a side note: Tombstone's one of my favorite movies. I don't. Know, I don't think I've seen that with Val Kilmer and yeah. Um, I don't think I've seen the it. guy who played the president in Independence Day. I can't remember his name. <laughs> That's my favorite president, President Whitmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great movie. It's an old, older one. It's from the early 90s. So, but. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I feel like you right now because you seem to not know any of the movies I talk about. No, but yeah, so uh, <laughs> next time you got like three hours on your hand, watch Tombstone. It's a long, oh, it's a long movie? It's a long Okay, long. I'll watch it. I'll watch it. <laughs> Women in Arizona were granted the right to vote eight years before the national suffrage, so Arizona was very progressive at that point in time. There aren't any dinosaur fossils at the Grand Canyon because the rocks are much older than dinosaurs. The only fossils you'll find are things like corals, sponges, and trilobites. The best preserved meteor crater in the world is located in Winslow, Arizona. And while Arizona is the sixth largest state in the U.S., only 17% of the land is privately owned. So uh, I'm guessing a lot of it's like BLM land. Is that true, Mike? Yeah. I, the vast majority of land you'll find in some of these Western states is, yeah, Bureau of Land Management land. So, yeah, like it, it, it's funny because it's basically unmanaged. It's unmanaged. And it's, it's, it is routinely, they do auction off chunks of it every once in a while. So two private, you know, seller or buyers. So, yeah, out there, it's like a lot of cattle. Uh, cattle owners and they let their cattle roam around in there and yeah a lot of a lot of private people have uh leases with the federal government to let you know animals graze on property like that so probably not so much in arizona but in some of the other western states yeah yeah you know, otherwise they'll eat that cactus and then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll have a lot of problems yeah <laughs> you know, um morton salt i'm sure everybody has morton salt in their house has been mining a salt deposit in the unincorporated town of glendale since the mid-1980s the salt deposit is about 40 square miles wide and more than half a mile thick that's crazy a lot of salt <laughs> that's a lot of salt yeah um oh i i, I just had a little fun side note that i just completely lost while i was talking about that dang it oh that's what it is mike do you know what what makes a town unincorporated i don't it doesn't have a mail office oh no post office. post office okay i think you've you've, only incorporated towns have post office i think you've mentioned that little fact before and i always i probably have it's like one of the few facts that i can rattle off that a lot of people don't know so i use it (laughs) to impress people at parties (laughs) and that's why i don't have a lot of friends or go to a lot of parties (laughs) (laughs) exactly um so just a more in-depth description of the features so the climate the southern months are obviously very hot with temperatures exceeding 100 degrees winter months are mild you get 70s uh and in the desert areas you still get pretty cold at night so Mm -hmm. you'll get lows in the 40s even though it's it's a warmer climate the monument preserves parts of the rugged sonoran desert so it is a lot of desert area again if you said old westerns are based in that area Mm -hmm. you can get an idea of what the climate looks like feels like cacti grow there yeah many cacti grow there (laughs) um the tallest point in the monument is mount aho at 4808 feet uh it's very dry rocky desert plant growth in water are very sparse so types of dangers um not much of like the big animals that'll get you. There's bats, mountain lions, uh, 
bighorn, Sonoran pronghorn, uh, kangaroo rats, kangaroo and uh, desert mice, mule deer, white-tailed deer, coyote, jackrabbit. There are rattlesnakes. Uh, there are four different species of lizard. I, there's five species of rattlesnakes. Yeah. And 270 species of birds. So desert, rocky, rugged, some poisonous animals. Probably rattlesnakes are going to be your biggest concern hiking. Yes. I've been on hikes where we've almost stepped on rattlesnakes. Just You don't see them until you're literally on top of them. And if you get bit by one out in the middle of nowhere and can't get to someone with antivenom, you're going to you're going to be in a world of hurt. <laughs> Especially if you're alone. Yeah. You know, trying to, to, yep. to get it all cut off and stuff like that. Uh, like put the tourniquet on. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never seen Ben jump so high from uh, when we were in Zion. And, and yeah, he that, was right in the path. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah. He had superhuman strength for about five seconds. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. He had a vertical that I think would have uh, uh, beat a couple of NBA players uh, yeah. just off of pure reactions. It was pretty, pretty incredible. Um, so the biggest risk outside of the rattlesnakes, extreme heat, sun exposure, uh, dehydration, mm-hmm. potential hypothermia at night in the winter months. And then if you don't have a shelter, obviously those things are, the exposure is just, just amplified. Yep. So just in general, due to the rugged and remote nature of the monument, it's a more difficult place to hike. You know, it's, it's like any desert hike. If you're not adequate at it, if you're a first timer, Odds are you're not right wearing the right clothes, but if you if you're out there, it's got to be like pants, long sleeve shirts, things that can wick uh, to protect your skin from the sun. No sandals. Yep. You know potentially gaiters around the the ankles uh, attached to your boots to protect from rocks and potential snakes. If you have special rated gaiters for snake bites. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, you know we we've done a lot of desert related areas on this show so i think people probably have a general idea of what the dangers are there so i'll jump into the character profile not much information here just uh we'll go over carol turner she's a female at the time of the disappearance on the third in 1971 she was 32 years old she was last seen wearing a yellow windbreaker she drove a 68 plymouth station wagon and she had a master's degree in education and was a secondary school teacher, was planning to get a master's degree in biology and zoology. So based on that, she loved hiking. Mm-hmm. She was very in tune with nature, a love to teach. So probably a great person to be around, especially to go on a hike with. We did mention she went on hikes with the rangers. So I'm sure as a teacher, she also liked learning about the different things. So yeah. how cool would it be to be able to go on hikes with the people that work in the park and learn all the details? You know, the few times when we go on hikes and talk to the rangers, it's just neat to learn little tidbits that you won't get off the brochure. You know, things that they've known and, and knowledge they've acquired over the years of being a ranger in that park. It's just really cool. Uh, it's complete side note, but this is about park rangers. Um, funny story from when we were hiking in the Tetons. Um, it was morning one of the days that we got up and we were heading out, and it had to have been pretty early in the morning, like 8 a.m., and we're walking down the trail, and all of a sudden behind us, like five park rangers with shovels are just sprinting down the trail. And we're, we're like two days into the park, so I don't know if they had been running for – you know, from a campsite for a while or, or what? But we, uh, <laughs> well, if you're two days there, it probably took them 40 minutes to catch yeah, up. Right. <laughs> Those people are, they're insanely fast on the trails. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, two, two sprinted by and we asked one of them, like what, what's going on? And they were in pursuit of somebody that was starting illegal fires in the park. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so they're like, they're like going to like stop, fu- man. Yeah. And add it to the list of amazing things they can do. Fight fires, uh, like, uh, yeah. upland wildland fire style. And the, the time of time period we were in the park, it was pretty wet. So I think they still had a fire warning up, but it, it just recently rained, I believe. But, you know, they take that stuff very serious because you can see what happens, you know, out in California when, you know, someone has one of those baby reveals or, you know, any of any of the reasons why a, a man-made fire gets started. But it can end up consuming, you know, towns and it ends up killing people sometimes. So they, you know, they take yeah, it pretty I think the, serious. The big, yeah, the biggest thing that I think I've even realized recently is like it's always kind of uh, – it's always like a weird feeling. Because when you look at a natural forest fire, you're like, man, it stinks. When we were in Glacier, it kind of stunk because, you know, it was like – sticks mm-hmm. everywhere you know and it was cool because you could see the rest of the mountain range 
it stinks because you don't see like the foliage and stuff, but it's also a natural part of the forest. But when they're started by people yeah. in areas where, you know, and, and it contributes to loss of life or people's homes, it's really unfortunate. So props to all those, the firefighters, the rangers and things that they literally fight fires by digging trenches with shovels. You know, they don't have water. It's so much harder to fight a fire yeah. in the back country. And it, you know, I think these guys were actually in pursuit of the person like the, the one ranger told us that they had reports from other campers that he was on this trail ahead of us <laughs> so they were they were in hot pursuit <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna put the fire out and beat the man with the shovels <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully not hopefully uh he was arrested and you know the criminal justice system <laughs> yeah let's, dealt with him. let's hope <laughs> <laughs> let's hope he was subdued uh, without violence, yeah. but, but I'm sure they could have handled it if he wasn't. Moral of the story, if you're in a park and they have signs up all over not to start fires, don't do it. Yeah, uh, leave no trace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we say it every episode, just don't do it. Um, there we go. So let, let's let's go into the timeline now. We okay. got an idea. Uh, very, very awesome hiking teacher getting her master's in biology and zoology. Uh, let's let's go through what happened to Carol on the on the day she disappeared. Hey friends, today's show is sponsored by the Made for TV Movie Club podcast, a comedy podcast that reviews TV movies from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Each episode takes listeners down memory lane with reviews of classic TV movies through the lens of humor and an eye for the fashions of the time. Never seen the movie? Don't worry. The hosts cover each movie from beginning to end. Join the club today by subscribing and listening to the show on your favorite podcast app. The Made for TV Movie Club podcast is available on all major podcast networks, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Radio Republic, Pocket Casts, Breaker, and many more. You can also find links to their website, Facebook page, Instagram page, and Twitter account in the summary of this episode. This all starts, like Joe said, on January 31st, 1971. So... Carol was a school teacher and she was on vacation. So she decided to drive to the monument for kind of a, you know, a three or four day kind of little camping trip by herself. And so she, she drives, I believe through the night and her first night there, she ends up actually sleeping in her car. But the, the February 1st and 2nd, she stayed at a uh, campsite near the main visitor center. So it's during this time that she goes on a ranger sponsored trip to a place called Dripping Springs. So these, I haven't been in a park. I'm I'm sure they still do them. I've never been on one, but these ranger sponsored trips are kind of, you know, like the the ranger, one or two of the rangers will, it it's almost like a, uh, they hike with you and talk to you about like features of the park and you know, it's like, like a guided tour. Kind of like a guided for, tour, yeah. For hiking. Yeah. So they'll take you on like one of the easier kind of day trails that you could do in a few hours, and they'll talk about different stuff. So, you know, she spends most of the day walking around with this group and specifically with the rangers. She, I guess she spent a lot of time talking with the rangers, and later on in the search, the, the rangers were, made the comments that she seemed really smart, was asking a lot of good questions, and that she appeared athletic. So this is really the only only comment that we have to, you know, that discusses her physical appearance. So we don't really have anything about any medical conditions, what she looked like. But, you know, one of the rangers did state that she appeared athletic. So we can assume that, you know, she's 32. She's probably in you know pretty good shape. If she's going on trips by herself to camp in National Park, she's I'm going to assume she's pretty fit. So. Um, but I, like I said, outside of that, we don't have any other details on, um, her physical appearance. So, yeah, I think we can take liberties as now experts on this topic. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say she's an experienced hiker. Okay. You know, based on, based on the schooling she's going to, um, if the, if the park people are impressed with what she has, I would say, I wouldn't go as far as to say she's a good backcountry backpacker, yep. but She's, she probably knows what she's doing on day hikes. So she probably is, uh, I'm, and she's wearing a windbreaker in the desert. So I think based on that type of stuff, you know, she didn't show up in a tank top and shorts with sandals. 
she probably has a very, very good advanced understanding of day hiking and is pro- was probably well prepared for the situation. Yeah, and it, <clears throat> we have to make a lot of assumptions. This is a an older case, and you know, I was able to find some research on it. There's a lot of archived, a couple archived newspaper reports, but you know, we you know cases like this, we do have to kind of sometimes make some assumptions on just based on all the different cases we've looked at and our own experience. So yeah, I think as long as we preference that kind of like when you use Reddit information, you, you give your disclaimer. <laughs> I think as long as we disclaim that, okay, now this is not official. This is our opinion or this is our theory. I yeah. think we, we should be good to go. That's my opinion. Yeah. So in, even in the timeline here, we're not exactly sure when things happen, but we know in general that they happen. So either the first or the second of February, she, she did her first hike up to bull pasture in the, uh, how'd you call it, Joe, the Ajo Mountains? Yes. Okay. Anyone that lives in this area, please correct us if we're wrong. If yeah, it's really... I said AJO at first, and then I realized it's probably Ajo. Ajo. Yeah, you're probably right. So, um, whatever. So uh, I'm sure I'll get corrected and <laughs> make people upset, and I don't mean to. <laughs> so she did her first hike up to Bull Pasture on the 1st or the 2nd. So now fast forward to February 3rd, uh, 1971. So Carol returns to the trailhead uh, and heads up to Bull Pasture again. And this time she had the foresight to leave a note on her car that read, if I'm not back and if this car is here at 430 on February 3rd, then call the Rangers. I'm up at Bull Pastures. So I'm trying to – so I have a couple things going on here, Joe. I think, one, I think – that's good practice uh, to – she's hiking by herself. She leaves a note on her car telling people where she is if she's not back here. If this car is still here, come look for me. Part of me, though, wonders, okay, she hiked up there the first time, didn't leave a note. Now she's hiking up there the second time, and she's leaving a note on her car. What What's different the second time where she's worried that there might be a chance she's not back by the end of the day? So – just yeah, it's 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 not technically an itinerary. Yeah. So she, she but I'm gonna call it that. Okay. So I'm gonna just call her, call this her itinerary because it's a day hike. Um, she didn't feel the need to leave on the first day, but did the second day. So I'm on board with you with that. That's that's kind of strange. So let's let's put a pin in this, <laughs> and then keep going because I, I don't want to get into the theories before we finish the timeline. Yeah. Okay. So she uh, she's hiking up to Bull Pasture on February third, and she so she leaves two more notes um at trail registers which this is an interesting thing because i've i've been i've hiked a lot in the national parks and i don't think i've ever come across a trail register i don't know if this is something that they used to do and got rid of them um have you ever seen a trail register in the parks when i was at kilimanjaro i had to do a check-in at each camp but i think that was less of a register and more of part of our permitting yeah so i had to sign they they had a note where you could leave notes so it was cool to read all the people's notes from all over the world that were doing it too okay um, maybe i just but missed you, them. you had <laughs> yeah you had to do your well like i said this was like a major destination yeah and this is like a national monument so maybe it could just be something that the rangers like to do there because be. i i'm with you on other trails i haven't really done that or maybe i missed it too <laughs> The the first register at the trailhead, uh, she left a note that said, Hi, if you have Binox, look for a white shirt or yellow windbreaker across the way and say hello. So, you know, it's a, a friendly little message to any other hikers. Um, now, she l- left one more note on a register up in Bull Pasture. Now, this one is a little odd, and even some of the, the research I did, other people have made mention that this is kind of strange. All she wrote was, I brought beer. Where are you? <laughs> so uh, is she just yeah, is she crazy. just being kind of like playful, like, oh, hey, I got the beer. Where are you? Or is she like actually – did she meet somebody and is communicating with them via these registers like, hey, I've got the beer. Where are you? So I don't know. Maybe I'm reading into it way too much. <laughs> no, I'm with you. There's something odd about that because that's like a text message. Right. And it's 1971. Yeah. So, so okay keep going okay so <laughs> we're gonna come back to this <laughs> um this this would be the last time anyone would see carol or would read anything carol wrote so february 3rd 1971 so on february 4th 1971 
a ranger driving around the parking lot sees the note on her car and he and he he immediately parks his car and hikes up to bull pasture doesn't see anyone he comes back out and calls law enforcement so she is basically reported missing the following day we don't have a timeline on the 4th of exactly when but we can assume you know she's been missing 12 to 24 hours at this point depending okay. on when were there any were there any noted major weather events between the 3rd and the 4th I will, I'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. Um, okay. One of the park rangers in the search mentions the weather conditions at the time. So. All right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'll be patient. Okay. Good. Um, so there are conflicting reports now on how long the search and rescue operation went. Uh, some things I read said it was two weeks. Some said three weeks. I I we're just going to go on the assumption that it kind of kicked off on the fourth of February and it went to the fifteenth of February, kind of that time frame so two to three weeks so <clears throat> later on that day uh law enforcement officials start arriving at the park the national park surface calls in air force support helicopters reports would go on to state that over 300 ground personnel joined the operation and covered uh, up to 120 square miles and uh combined used up 3600 hours of search and rescue time so um a massive search and rescue operation, not only in uh, scope, but in also the ground covered. So, you you know, 120 square miles is huge. Yeah, that's a big space to cover. I mean, this park is only, what, 520 square miles or whatever you said earlier, Joe. So, I mean, they literally are searching, you know, a fourth of the park. Yeah. So that's a, that's a huge search area. It's a lot of times it's not that big, but... So, and they had all kinds of, op, you know, people out there. I, I read that they had rock climbers and dog teams. And um, so, and it, they also noted that the search operation was close to the Mexico border. So they also had the help of U.S. Border Patrol and Customs. So uh, several federal agencies were also involved in the search. And something really interesting, too, um, her disappearance happened near some tribal areas so they actually had a uh, tribal law enforcement helping in the search so uh it's really cool to see i think f from what i read there were probably 10 or 15 different uh agencies between the tribal nations the state and federal government involved in the search so mm -hmm. a lot of coordination going on um and she did and i'm just reiterating i'm sorry if it's bugging people but she did this trail the day before the third right she did it yeah she did it on the first or the second once so she had already been up in this area before okay. yeah yeah because i'm i'm just looking at all trails right now and they're saying the trail is 3.9 mile uh lightly traffic loop so it's a loop so mm -hmm. you basically can go one way the entire time and end up back where you started yeah um people are rating it as moderate so not hard not yeah. easy um and it would take you know just a few hours to do yeah i mean it, it'd be something okay. that something that our group would do at like the end of a trip when we've got maybe four hours to burn you know sure before we have oh, to leave. I'll, I'll, I'll i'll real quick i'll just mention what this is so all trails if you're not a hiker it's an app and a website where people it's kind of like uh how ways you can uh, the, the roadmap, like you can report potholes and things in the road on all trails, people can record their time and trails and then they rate what it's like and people update it for weather conditions and stuff. So you can get a lot of information. If you're ever listening to our show mm -hmm. in a national park and want to check out some of the trails that we're talking about, this is like the best resource for people talking about how hard it is, the weather, all that type of stuff. So, and, right, uh, sorry, sorry for the deviation. Well, no, and I'll also say, and I'll apologize to the listeners. I've, I've made these comments several times. I will get around to updating our show notes and we will include stuff like all trails in our show notes so that if you're listening, you can kind of follow through and see some of the stuff we're talking about. Um, just Joe and I, Joe and I are pretty busy these days. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, getting back to the search for uh, Carol, um, this is where things started getting a little, little strange. And this was part of the reason why I was interested in this case. Um, before what I'm about to talk about, this is kind of one of your, I, I hate to say it, you know, I'm not making light of her disappearance, but, you know, a disappearance like hers is pretty common in 
in national parks, you know, people go hiking by themselves and they get lost, hurt, uh, you know, and aren't found. Um, but what happens next with some of the rangers in the search is kind of just, it's strange to me. So during this search between the 4th and the 15th, um, one of the rangers going up to that canyon tells his buddy that he smelled decaying flesh. Uh, that bothered a lot of people because it was early in the search from the time Carol disappeared for her body to, to start decaying to that level where, you you know, they, they would expect that kind of decay to happen much later on in a search. And there's, they're, they find it odd because it's strong enough smell that these guys are smelling it from the trail. So, yeah, and those people are used to like I would say the normal environmental smells of that area. Yep. So the fact that he brought it up and thought it was strange, I'd say, is a very, very legitimate. Yeah, and I mean, claim. I've I've even, you know, I've come across you know animal carcasses while hiking, and I'm well aware of the distinct smell of, you know, like a rotting animal carcass, and you can tell some of these have been here for weeks. And they've been, you know, gnawed on by other animals. And it's a very distinct smell. It's mm-hmm. it's not a smell that these guys, like, m- mistook for something else. I mean, I fully believe that they smelled rotting flesh. <laughs> um, so, like we said, that, that disturbed the rangers because of how, f- you know, fresh the search was. So the rangers get back and report this information. So now they send multiple teams uh, into bull pasture area trying to get that same smell and to try and figure out where it came from. They also brought multiple dog teams with them. So we're, we're not saying days later. We're, we're probably a matter of hours later. And okay. all the multiple teams and, and the dogs got nothing. No scent was found. No, They couldn't smell anything. Um, so just not because I'm going to end up playing devil's advocate later. So we now have one guy – who smelled this and reported it and did other people also witness it with him at the time? Well, I will, uh, I'll get into that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, like I said, that their multiple teams went in there and they, uh, trying to get that same smell. Uh, they didn't get anything. And according to the Pima County police report, which was included in the national park service report, they went into the area called the Ajos. Uh, it's a southwest-facing mountain up on Bull Pasture. And in this area, some of the other rangers several days later experienced the same odor. So now we have oh, okay. now we have multiple rangers that have experienced the smell, and it actually made it into the official police report. So um, I, think, I think that makes it much more credible that it was written into the report. It wasn't just some kind of like one guy – you know, like, oh, Bob always smells weird stuff. Like, <laughs> um, so <laughs> going on, a, a ranger named Royals wrote uh, a report that they had searched her car. And the only thing they could determine that was missing after speaking with her mom was her hiking boots and a, her canteen. Uh, this may have indicated that she had only planned on doing a day hike. So based on what you were saying, Joe, about this trail, I think it's very likely that she only intended to do a day hike here. She took her boots and a canteen and, uh, you know, started hiking. Now, one thing I will say is um, if I'm hiking in the desert, I'm taking more than a canteen of water with me, even if it's Mm -hmm. a four mile hike. Um, I know this is February, so it's, it's cooler in that park at this time, but you're still in the desert. Um, I would bring a couple liters of water with me, but that, yep. that's just me. <laughs> uh, so going on, you know, we've got some, some more uh, reports to read from Pima County and then a couple quotes. So in the Pima County report, um, which was written by one of the Rangers, it read, One additional clue was turned up on Monday, February 15th, at two limited locations about 400 yards apart on the southwest-facing uh, side of the Ajos. A very strong and distinct human odor was found, but at no other locations. Supervisory Ranger Hal Koss of the Seguero and one of the other searchers who were recently involved in the recovery of a body had a very strong and positive feelings on the identified on the identification of the odor. So he also continues to write, 
The following day, Ranger Koss, after flying the area in a Border Patrol plane, led an eight-man search party back over this area. Again, the odor was observed in the same location, but on, but only occasionally and not as distinct. Other members of the t- team described it as very weird and scary. Uh, described the area as very weird and scary. All efforts were negative, and search activities have been reduced to intermittent patrols and as time permits. So, uh, pretty strange. I think these smells of, you know, decaying flesh are very odd. Mm-hmm. Well, in, in the part where they say the two guys that have done um, recovery already that would be able to identify the smell, yep. pegged it as that. So, that's like less of someone saying, hey, it smells like rotting flesh, more like, hey, I know exactly what the smell is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's also I find I find this the part where they mention that the area seemed weird and scary coming from park rangers who probably have been in this area before know that, you know, the park. I find that odd. You you don't usually hear park rangers describing areas of their park as scary. Um I couldn't find any other information or context on why they called it weird and scary if it was you know, they call it weird and scary, like it's like gnarly, like it's tough hiking, or like were they actually fearful of their life while they were up there? <laughs> um, so don't yeah. don't know, but that just adds kind of to the mystery. So <clears throat> we've got a couple quotes here from uh, some of the people involved in the the search. Lieutenant Oglesby, uh, who was one of the the guys on the search, was quoted as saying, "Everybody, the monument people." Our people, the Border Patrol, the Cells Law and Order, uh, has worn themselves to the nub looking for this woman. They're all experienced, and they've gone over the whole place with a fine-tooth comb. None of them see how she could have been missing if she's in there. So he, you know, and we've seen this from other stories, like he's convinced that they covered every square inch of this area, and there, she should be in there. At least her body should be there. Um, so someone else mentioned that this was the largest search operation to date in the monument. And I believe it still is. And, um, according to, uh, Rod Boyles, uh, the chief ranger for Oregon pipe, uh, what may have happened is she wandered away from the base in a bull pasture and somehow injured herself. Perhaps she slipped and fell off a cliff. February 3rd was a cold blustery day. And to get out, out of bad weather, she crawled into one of the hundreds of tiny caves that lined the cliffs. Dense brush grew right up against the cave entrance, and uh, there she died. The brush has hidden the grave from uh, our searchers, so we haven't found her. So that's a you know a devil's advocate, you know, saying that nothing weird happened here. She just uh, succumbed to the uh, the elements. Um, I think before we get into theories and. What, what you think, Joe, I, my final thoughts just on this one are, you know, was Carol planning to meet someone uh, based on her comment about bringing beer? Uh, why are experienced rangers making the comments about the area being scary, especially if they've been through, you know, that area dozens of times before? Um, the fact that this was 1971, it's 2021, so much time has passed and so many thousands of people have probably gone through that area yet no signs of Carol have been found yet. Um, I think that's an interesting aspect to maybe she's not in the park and which leads me to my final point with it being so close to the Mexican border. Could there be some type of criminal aspect to this disappearance? (laughs) A lot to eat, a lot to chew on there. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, what do you think? I think the official theory based on the chief ranger is that she injured herself somehow and succumbed to the elements. What do you think? So let's break it down because it is desert near U.S. Mexican border. There is always sections of those areas, especially when there's available trails where crime can be an issue or trafficking can be an issue. Yep. I'm going to go out and say I think that that is less likely. I think it's less likely that she encountered somebody or something on a loop trail because it simply doesn't go anywhere. And this is my speculation. I don't know anything. I'm not an expert on 
you know, how those trails are used by criminals. But a lot of the trails in other places that aren't a loop actually connect places together. So they're, they're a usable path to get from point A to point B. Whereas a loop trail is quite literally, I'm going to start here. There's something neat to see somewhere up this trail and the trail comes right back to here and that's it. And it was relatively small. So I, I, I'm going to say, I don't believe it was criminal. Um, I would, I would side with the ranger who said, that she probably got injured, was escaping some sort of weather thing. You know, maybe she got bit by a rattlesnake while while climbing around the rocks and succumbed that way. Um, I mean, yeah. that, that's plausible. I think it, it makes me think it's more plausible after the Paul Miller case because they had a huge search for him in a loop trail in desert climate, and they couldn't find him, and they ended up finding his remains, and it wasn't too far off where the path was. It was just a difficult area, and they had to use FLIR to find him. Um, obviously, in 1971, they didn't have helicopters with FLIR attached, so I wonder if it's they had that many people because it is truly very difficult to search for somebody in desert climate. Um, so I, I would say I'm 80, 80 to 90% agreeing with the ranger in that regard. The one thing that throws me off is the very weird comments from the Rangers about being spooked out by an area of a park that they should know about. Like, why did they all of a sudden get a spooky feeling about this section of the park and what was up with the, the, the smells kind of coming and going. I, I, that, that's confusing me and that, that like, if I want to go down the supernatural route, what does that mean in that regard? Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think, uh, I, I tend to side on the theory that the chief ranger uh, mentioned that she most, you want your most rational theory. I think she, she was up there and maybe she felt more comfortable in bull pasture on her second hike. So she was doing a little, you know, sightseeing off trail and maybe she, like he said, slipped and fell, got injured and maybe it was, kind of towards the end of the day so she she's like well i'm gonna take you know she doesn't have probably gear to stay out in the cold that night so she's like i'm gonna take a shelter in this little cave here maybe and maybe once inside the cave she got bit by a rattlesnake or something happened her injury was more severe than she thought and she passed away in the cave and they just didn't happen to just you know find her in that cave i think if they truly hiked, searched the park as in depth as we're told to believe, I would think if she had just crawled into one of those caves, the dogs would have found her. Um, I, th- I agree, especially like they have cadaver dogs. So yeah. if people are smelling it, how would a dog A dog it? is going to smell know, it from we, a mile away if a human smells it. I mean, exactly. Yeah. And that's like the only time we ever hear about like the dogs being thrown off is if like nature or things have washed the scent away. So again, if humans are smelling it, there's no reason why a dog would not pick up on that scent. And if the dog is not, what are they smelling? Yeah. So they, yeah, that so for those of you listening that are kind of like the more supernatural bent, um, what is that smell coming from? Um, I know if you you believe in things like Bigfoot or Sasquatch that people claim there's a very distinct odor when one of those creatures is present. So, you know, on the far other end of the spectrum that's you can't prove it and we will never know that maybe maybe that's what happened. I think there's a s- slight chance that she maybe was abducted by a criminal element that was in the park at the time. I mean, we know for a fact from the the quick story about that law enforcement officer that was shot and killed by you know drug dealer drug smugglers from Mexico in 2002 that that kind of element does exist in the park so you know could it be like a Paul Fugate type story where she just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and that might explain why no one has found her remains yet um it's a pretty remote park it's not traveled that often you know this is the 70s so um, it's off season, you know, it's February. It's not yeah, one it's of like the... right during a lot of the cocaine stuff that's going on yeah. with Mexico. And so, okay. That, I, I would say that raises the possibility a little bit more than I initially thought. I'll agree with you on that. Yeah. So I don't know. I think, I think both theories are interesting. Um, 
I think that she hurt herself and is still in the park is kind of the the easier theory to to talk about. But I I think being that close to the border, um, you know, perhaps there was a criminal element involved and they abducted her and um, she's not in the park anymore. And that's why, you know, such an extensive search turned up nothing. So I, I don't know that we'll we'll ever know. It's been so long now since she went missing and they haven't found anything. Um, who knows? But yeah, interesting case. I, I fi- always find it interesting when there's other things at play, like these weird smells that the humans were smelling, but the dogs couldn't pick up. And, um, yeah, that, that's really what's getting to me is like, have we just constantly been wrong about how good these dogs right? are? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that's not the case. I don't think we and are I though. Look, I think they I are look pretty, at the map and it's, yeah, yeah it, this, this park is on the border. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's literally on the it's border. On, yeah. It's, yeah. It's not near the border. It's on the border. Yeah. And I don't believe there's fences or anything there. Well, there might be, I don't know. I don't know about back yeah. in the seventies. Yeah. Probably not back in the seventies. So, yeah. So I, uh, you know, I don't have anything else to share in this case, but uh, any final thoughts from you, Joe? Nope. Uh, just thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate all of you for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to like us and follow us on Facebook. That's been growing significantly, and it it helps our reach, and I I think that's where a lot of our patrons are coming from. So please do like and share us on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter as well. Uh, And if you don't like using the podcast apps, uh, we have a YouTube channel, so you can go and subscribe to the YouTube channel where we do post the audio for our shows. And if you would like to support the show monetarily as well as with your listening and sharing, you can visit the Facebook store and pick up some cool swag or become a patron. And not only will you also get some cool swag just for being a patron, we do release patron-only episodes. So there are several, I think five, and we're recording number six or number seven seven We have six out already. Boom. We have seven patron (laughs) episodes right now that if you're not a patron, you could go and listen to seven more (laughs) episodes of me and Mike talking about random things. Yes. Um, (laughs) Which I know everybody wants. Yeah. Um, so again, you can, you can sign up for that and every little bit helps us, uh, improve the show quality and build out a bigger and better show. And always remember when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or just taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Otherwise a brigade of shovel wielding Rangers will be running down the trails after you. (laughs) (laughs) So thanks. And we will see you all next time.